This video is being sponsored by Minwax, offering a wide variety of wood stains, finishes, conditioners, fillers, and more for your woodworking projects. Learn more about their products at minwax.com. Minwax makes and keeps wood beautiful. I had the opportunity to build a 50 inch round sculpted kitchen table for a local client. The table needed to be completed before Christmas of 2022. I picked up the lumber for this project on November 29th and allowed it to acclimate to my shop environment. I bought eight quarter red oak for this project. Red oak is hard, heavy, and has a coarse uneven grain texture that many of my clients like. Also, it stains well and is often the wood I recommend for budget projects. After inspection, I chose the best looking boards with the most appealing grain texture to make up the 50 inch round tabletop. Sometimes I'll change my mind after milling because once you start peeling back some of the layers of wood, the grain texture changes and you'll see things you didn't see prior to milling. I then went to the bandsaw and ripped the rougher, more uneven edge to make edge jointing a little easier and faster. I'll then flatten the boards on the jointer and then plane down to final thickness. Once the boards have been flattened and planed, I rearrange the boards to my liking. I'll mark them with a carpenter's triangle so that I can recreate the orientation. Also, each joining edge receives an alternating I or O to signify in towards the fence of the joiner or out away from the fence of the joiner. I've mentioned this in past videos, but I feel like it's important to reiterate these types of best practices. This technique is done to create two complementary edges and to cancel out any variation in your joiner fence if it is not perfectly perpendicular to your joiner table. And as you can see here, I'm placing the outside edge pointed away from the jointer fence. If done correctly, you should get a perfectly flat jointed edge without any gaps. With the boards milled, I cut biscuit slots to help with alignment. And my daughter insisted on seeing the biscuit joiner because she thought it cut biscuits in half. She was a little disappointed with the result. I then applied glue to the biscuit slots on both sides and clamped the boards together to a total width and length of 53 inches. I always add a little extra to give me some flexibility with the location of the center of the tabletop. I've started using a new design software called Shaper 3D. It boasts an intuitive user interface that is controlled by your fingers and a stylus on a PC or Mac tablet. I was able to come up with a sculpted table based design within a matter of a few minutes that were all based on 2D sketches. I can isolate that sketch plane and then export it as a vector graphic, in this case, a DXF file. From there, I can import the DXF file into my CAM software, which is Vetric Aspire, to create tool paths for the outline of my templates. I then assign the task of cutting out perfect templates for the base assembly on my 48 inch CNC machine. With the glue dried on the tabletop, I use my router and a shop made trammel to cut the profile of the 50 inch round tabletop. I do not go all the way through. Instead, I use a jigsaw to rough cut the shape and leave a little bit of material to finish trim using a flush trim bit on my router. Having templates allows me to do a better job of laying out parts by avoiding knots and imperfections while seeing the grain pattern of the wood as it relates to the outline of the furniture parts. I ended up using the straightest grain sections of these boards. Once they were rough cut to length and width, they were flattened, milled up to final thickness, and edge jointed. I then double stick taped the templates to my work pieces. I like to use a hard rubber roller to make sure the double stick tape is properly secured. I also go ahead and mark the center line locations of the loose tenons, which will be cut using the domino machine. The legs, upper and lower cross members are all cut to precise bevel angles. What is that angle? I don't know, and it really doesn't matter. I'm using a shop made L fence to cut out those angles according to the templates. I simply attach the L fence to my table saw rip fence and raise the blade to ride along the template, but not low enough so that the L fence is cut by the table saw blade. 
I then bring the L fence flush with the outside edge of the table saw blade. The template rides along the edge of the fence as a guide and the offcut freely releases underneath the fence without being pinched between the blade and the rip fence. Next, I cut the joinery and since I've already marked the loose tenon center lines, it's simply a case of lining up the domino machine to the center line and plunge. A few toggle clamps and a workbench with dog holes make securing the workpiece fast. To join the upper and lower cross members, I cut a half lap at the center of each of the cross members. This is done on the table saw with a cross cut sled and a flat bottom grind table saw blade. I just absolutely love getting that perfect friction fit. Next, I rough cut the inside outline of the table legs at the bandsaw. I like using a sharpie marker to trace out my outlines. When I'm cutting on the bandsaw, I try to leave just a little bit of the marker so that I can go back and flush trim everything at the router table. And whenever possible, I try to use a router table starting pin for support. To attach the table to the base assembly, I'm using wooden buttons attached to the tabletop with bolts and threaded inserts that are captured within elongated slotted holes within the base assembly. To make the wooden buttons, I cut out a notch at the table saw and then countersink a set of holes at the drill press. I then drill corresponding holes within the tabletop and tap and epoxy the threaded inserts. I then round the ends of the wooden buttons at the disc sander. All of the parts of the base assembly get a 3 quarter inch round over to give the piece a sculpted look. To do this and to produce a tear out free base assembly, I start with a quarter inch bit, I then progress to a half inch bit, and then do a final pass with a 3 quarter inch bit. I then glue up the base assembly. I first start with the cross members. Once I glue up the half lap, I drill a 3 8 inch hole at the center of the joined cross members, drive in a dowel to add extra strength to the half lap, and flush cut the excess. With the cross members glued up, I devised a method to glue up the splayed legs. I first applied glue to all the mortises and then attached the splayed legs. With the base assembly placed upside down, I then used quick grip trigger clamps at each of the joints to create a ledge. I placed the strap clamp brackets on top of the trigger clamps and then tightened the strap clamps down. The trigger clamps prevented the strap clamps from shifting down the splayed legs. I did the same procedure for the lower cross members. With the base assembly drying in the clamps, I created the edge profile for the tabletop. To create a softened Thinner look, I routed a 1 8 inch roundover on the top edge profile of the tabletop and a 3 quarter inch roundover on the bottom edge profile of the tabletop. During the milling of the splayed legs, I had accidentally dented the mating joint of one splayed leg, which resulted in a small gap between that splayed leg and the upper cross member. To fill that gap, I used Minwax's high performance wood filler, which dries hard without any shrinkage and is easily sanded and accepts stain and finish. High performance wood filler is a two part component that is similar to Bondo. I then progressed through the sanding grits, starting first with 120 grit and then 180 grit. I especially paid close attention to the joints between the splayed legs and the cross members using a soft interface pad to ensure that the sanding process didn't create any unsightly facets. And of course, I did the same progression for the tabletop. Next, I applied Minwax's water-based pre-stain conditioner to prevent blotching or uneven coverage of the water-based stain. I applied the pre-stain conditioner with a stain applicator and then wiped away the excess with shop towels. Pre-stain conditioner will raise the grain of the wood so I do a final sanding at 220 grit right before applying a water-based stain. I used the Heritage Oak colored water-based stain which is a light brown in order to neutralize the pinkish color of the red oak. I have found that a 4 inch foam roller is the best way to quickly apply the water based stain to larger areas. 
Within two minutes of applying the stain, I wipe off all the excess with chopped towels. In this case, I only applied one coat of stain to achieve the base color I was looking for. To create a layered effect, I'm using Minwax's water-based weathered gray color wash. This product is significantly thinner and creates a gray tone over top of the heritage oak stain. To apply the color wash, I go against the grain with a foam roller and wipe away the excess. Right before applying the top coat, I installed leveling feet which is nothing more than a counter board hole with an epoxied insert and a metal glide foot at the end of a threaded rod. I used Minwax's oil modified water-based poly, which is a durable water-based top coat that adds a slight amber tone to the finish. I like to spray my top coat using an HVLP spray system with a 1.5 millimeter tip and nozzle at 5.5 PSI. I adjusted the spray fan on my HVLP gun to cover approximately a span of 6 inches at 6 to 8 inches from the work surface. While applying finish, I try to get a 50% overlap from my previous spray path. Now I like to spray my top coat, but always make sure to refer to the instructions on the label for the recommended application method. I allowed the finish to dry for approximately 2 hours and then knocked down any dust nibs or rough surface with 4 aught steel wool in between coats. I then vacuumed the surface to get rid of any debris. I applied a total of 3 coats of oil modified poly and let the piece dry for a total of 24 hours before doing a final assembly. And with a little help from my wife. I was able to get the tabletop attached to the base assembly for one last look before it was sent off to the client. Thanks for watching.